to welcome you back to Be the Vessel Now and Be the Boss Now. Um, the entire time our last speaker was speaking, Kathy, the Lord uh, dropped a song down in me that was from way back in 1997. And it was just a little clip. I didn't get the rest of it yet. But it goes, um, uh, promises, promises, promises to cling on to. Promises, promises. Promises they cannot fail, and it's a choir and it goes up. He has given us promises, promises, promises that cannot fail. Promises, promises, promises to cling on to. Just open up his book to the guy he's given you. He's promised you will hear his voice and you'll know what to do. Abundantly above. What we ask or think he does, impossible with man, is a light thing in his hands. But promises, promises, do not, I'm saying do not let go of what God has placed in you. Each of us has an individual scroll. It's like straight up. Open your mouth, because I'm going to download inside of you what your life was intended to accomplish. But all of these little special, uh, maybe humans, try to tell you, let go of that thing that you keep thinking is going to happen. And you need to say uh, H to the E to the L to the L. No. <laughs> right? No, we're not doing it. And so I am so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is a person who refuses to be confined to the day. Oh, I'm crying. <laughs> um, our next speaker has been an assignment of mine since birth. Um, our next speaker carries giftings that take that personnel into spaces that you and I couldn't go into. Um, our next speaker is a person who, you know, always pay attention when the Lord wakes you up. Because the Lord will say, I need you to pray right now, Sean. And you do it. Because you don't know the difference you're making in somebody else's life. So I am, besides myself, excited to introduce Mr. Dominique Daly Harris. And he's my nephew. <laughs> And trust me, I wanted to I wanted to pray over all you guys, but you know it's kind of been a little like woo, time and all that. But I'm gonna pray over Dominique. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, can I touch you? I thank you for the solid heart that you have placed inside of Dominique, Lord God. And I ask, Lord God, that in this moment, Lord, that you would, sh like, uh, what was it? there was a movie where they ripped the heart out of someone. That you would just literally <laughs> dig in, rip out his heart, and squeeze everything that's in him out. Uh. That it would produce fruit in this room, in this state, in the nation, and around the globe. So I thank you for Dominique Daly Harris, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hello, everybody. Hey. Let me get my notes. <laughs> um, so, I hit this up a little bit. <clears throat> when my auntie asked me to share, my immediate answer was like, of course. But then I was like, but I'm going to share, you know, like, because <laughs> I wasn't quite sure, you know, where to start or, you know, how I'm going to finish and if I'm going to even capture people, you know, with what I'm trying to say. But I think God really wanted me to just, like, let you know how thankful I am, you know, just... <laughs> to him um, and 
hopefully you guys will adapt the same gratefulness within you because I feel like it's like mandatory, you know, <clears throat> to just have that utmost appreciation for what the Heavenly Father's doing um, in, you know, yourself. Um, I'm a little nervous, but <laughs> bear with me. So, I'm going to start with just a scripture um, that the Lord gave me. So, Psalms 100. <clears throat> if you guys know it, then great. If not, you can open up your Bibles and read on. So, it says, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. I know that song. You know, you guys heard that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and when I read this verse for the first time, like that song kind of like came in my head, you know, like as I said that part, enter his, in, you know, you guys know that song? Yeah. yeah. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving. I will, I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice when he has made me glad. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. So, um, be thankful to him and bless his name. Over the past like couple years, I've been learning a lot about blessing and like the impartation of blessing. Thankful, you know, because of my father and my mother, um, and like, so I understand the concept of blessing you know, my children and blessing my wife and blessing my household. And so when I'm like, okay, bless God, you know what I'm saying? Like, bless his name, you know, like, how can I do that? You know, he's the one with all the, you know, power and all the, you know, but little did I know, you know, that he's actually commanding that of me, you know, to bless him as well, you know. So, and bless his name, for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So, that's one of the scriptures I want to share. Um, the other one is going to be First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, to me, that's pretty much like when I'm down and out, you know, when I'm going through trials and tribulations, and when I'm suffering, to thank God for this suffering, thank, you know, like, to thank Him for this, um, and that would, that's kind of confusing because it's like, I'm hurting. God, don't you want me to do good? You know what I'm saying? Like, don't you want me, like, you really want me? Like, then I think about, like, prophets like Job, you know what I'm saying, who loses everything, you know, and he's just like, well, I got you, God, you know? So, you know, I just have to, you know, realize that. Yes, in everything, give thanks, you know? Yes. And just read the scripture again for what it says, you know? And what does it say? <laughs> in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So, yeah. Um, another scripture is Hebrews 13, 15. Therefore, by him... Let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. So, with these three scriptures, 
I mean, and that's just three, you know, I'm sure you can dig into the roots, you know, of his word and realize that, you know, being thankful is, is everything. Um, for me, like, I don't know. It's probably this way for a lot of other people too. It's easy to kind of get caught up in, you know, the distractions and the despair and the pandemic and like, you know, all this stuff that's going on. But it's like, man, you know, I woke up today, you know, for starters. I'm healthy, you know, I mean, I'm sure I got some screws loose and you know some stuff like that but i'm i'm working i'm operating um so you know i can't complain you know people ask me how you doing i can't complain you know what i'm saying i'm thankful i'm i'm grateful you know and and like being grateful you know it's just like i don't know it's kind of magnetic you know as well uh i remember I mean, it's not even like remembering times. I'm still going through times where it's like, I shine. Even if I feel dimmed or if I just feel like I'm just like moving step by step, there's still people who are kind of like, you know, and who knows, maybe they're going through something that's even deeper than something I've been through, but they're like wanting to know what makes me keep going. You know what I'm saying? And wanting like, what? And I'm like, man, I'm just, I'm thankful, but then I'm like, you know, like, what do you, what, how do you say, like, what do you say to people, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's going to spark that flame in them to, like, keep them going, you know, and it's, I think my, you know, I think the reason the Lord put this on my heart is just to realize that, you know, even just letting people see me be thankful and me be grateful is all I need to do, you know? I don't need to give them something. I don't need to try to find the right answer to their problems or try to seek their problems so I could come up with a solution. But if people, if anybody that's watching me, for them to just see my thankfulness and my gratefulness. So <clears throat> with that being said, I'm gonna let you guys hear a song. <clears throat> I don't even remember when I wrote this. It was some time ago, going through one of my trials and tribulations. Um, but I had it in my heart to share it tonight, so. Um, <clears throat> Every day I thank the Lord, so I get on my knees and pray. Because every time I talk to God, he's always been there to lead the way. So why wouldn't I thank him? He's never left me when I was down. I was the prodigal son out there lost, but thanks to him, I was found. Amen. So every day I got to praise the Lord. I got to pray and give him thanks. Every day I got to praise the Lord, pray and give him thanks every day. Every day I got to praise the Lord, pray and give him thanks every day. Every day I got to praise the Lord, pray and give him thanks every day. Now, when I wrote this, the way I'm hearing it in my head is like not me saying it, you know. I, and it was strange when it came to me because I pictured a choir, you know what I'm saying? Like a massive choir that's just like. Give him thanks every day. You know, like, just like a big, like, you know, and it's, yeah. so, like, that's what I want, like, you know, but, um, and then, so it goes, you gotta thank the Lord, thank the Lord, yeah, you gotta thank the Lord, thank the Lord, yeah, you gotta thank the Lord, thank the Lord, because he'll never leave and forsake you. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord, you know, you gotta thank the Lord, thank the Lord, you know, you gotta thank the Lord, thank the Lord. I get down on my knees and thank you. And then I say, 
I want to thank you, Lord, for always being there for me. You were there for all the times I thought that no one cared for me. You scared, you shared with me scriptures. You given me dreams and pictures. You taught me to shut my mouth, open my eyes, and be a listener. As quiet as a whisper and as loud as a lion. You said I belong to you. You said that you're proud. I'm trying. I found I'm dying every moment I'm away from you. But you helped me make it through. That is why I'm thanking you. You deserve the glory, the honor, the praise. I let you control my life so I no longer am afraid. You gave me wow. hope. You let me know my life has purpose. That I'm not worthless and that my sins have all been purchased. Yeah. You help me stand tall on my feet when I have fallen. So with no hesitation, your name I am always calling. I give my all into you because nothing can change you. You always came through when I needed you, so I thank you. Wow. Every day I thank the Lord, so I get on my knees and pray. And every time I talk to God, he's always been there to lead the way. To lead the way. So why wouldn't I thank him? He's never... You picture the choir, right? Yeah. 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 I was a prodigal son, 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 I was a prodigal son. Now, at the time that I had that put on my heart, there were people that was, because I mean, that wasn't the only thing I'm writing, you know, like, I, I enjoy writing, so I'm writing all type of stuff, you know, and there's people coming to me. And they're asking me to hear different things, you know what I'm saying, that I put together. And that one, though, was like bringing tears to people, you know, that's like, I, I was on vacation, you know, at the time I wrote it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, not the Bahamas, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, but, <laughs> one day. But, um, you know, there was people that's like, you know, doing like 20 years, you know, that's like, you know, just lost their kid or, you know, going through all types of things and they just want to hear something, you know, from, you know, that I wrote. And I'm like, and that, that's where I kind of go back to my scripture right here where I said, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves, you know, so. I used to get into like a, oh yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I really, people like this, you know what I'm saying? Like, I did that, you know? Like, I did that, you know? Nah, you know, like, that's not, I didn't make me, you know what I'm saying? Like, my parents, they didn't make me, I mean, they made me, you know what I'm saying? But, like, I'm just a vessel, you know? I'm just a, so, yeah, I just want to share that. So, thank you guys. Oh, wow. Um, thank you. Be the best one. And thank you. Hello. Wait, just give us one more thing. I got to go grab something right quick. Nice commercial, Donald. Oh, God. One more thing. One more thing. Throw another wrap out there. No pressure. No pressure. Um, I have no fear as I'm walking through this valley of death. Prodigal son returning home and my mentality's fresh. I shall be the best I could be. Stress no longer oppresses me. I'm blessed, so defeat does not determine my destiny. Because even though I've fallen, I'm still standing and still strong. From the ground, making foundations that I could build on, reflecting and correcting wrong decisions I've made, I'd rather die than live a life feeling like I live in a grave. Ooh. Death's not an option out the coffin till the day I'm deceased. One day at a time, ever since the day they said I'm released. They said I'm a beast. They cuffed me and locked me away. Thinking I'd give up all my hope, but that will not be the day. Because time's ticking, my mind's spinning. I'm on a blind mission. Desperate and hurting, and searching. I'm trying to find vision so my eyes focus. Patiently watching, feeling death approaches. Those no submission, though the system had thought that they left me hopeless. Wow. Oh. And then it's like, I'm never giving up, never giving in. I live to win, my friend. So I'll never be hopeless. I'll never be hopeless. 
I'm never taking my eyes off the prize, though I could lie with pride inside. Still, I gotta stay focused. Nice. I gotta stay focused. Yeah. You know something like yeah. that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And another thing. Another thing, um, I don't know, I felt like trapped for so long, feeling like, and, and I hated the system that caged me, you know, like the jail system and whatnot, I hated that, you know, and I always felt like that was my captor, you know what I'm saying, like that was, even getting off probation, I'm like, oh yes, finally I'm free, you know what I'm saying, like, but I was still enslaved, you know what I'm saying, for so long. And the devil still want me. Don't get me wrong, you know, like he still he still he ain't gonna stop. But yeah. Okay, yeah. When in my time, that's what I meant to say, my aunt was there for me, you know. Like I remember they didn't even have to come see me, but they came to Washington, they drove to Washington to come visit me. You know, and get beat by me in chess and scrabble. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so giving me this platform is this was amazing. I appreciate you. Aww. And now I'm gonna make him sing a rap song, one that one that one that is Aunt Chandra, okay? <laughs> and so he's gonna just come in when he needs to be coming. He's he'll pick it up right quick. We're, and it's a choir again, but it ain't just a choir. It's like a whole stadium, right? His friends in our family. It's a whole stadium. We're shouting out his name at the break of any day. We're shouting out his name at the break of any day. J E S U S, sweet Jesus. J E S U S, sweet Jesus. Shout down. Swoop down, snatch him up. No more talking off the side of your head. Swoop down, snatch him up. No more talking off the side of your head. Now, listen to this. Disarm that speech, ripped up those deeds, torn down that life, bound down in crowds. In faces he laughed, no shame he gained. The crime his time at noon, it's done. Midnight still tune, broke out at dawn. His light we shine. Set them free. Set them free. Shout me his name. Let the break of any day. We've been rehearsing this. You guys have been rehearsing this. Not the Sweet Jesus. J-E-S-E-S. Sweet Jesus. Pray the fuel that his word we speak. Break through death feet. Come forth and come out of penalty. Gives new kicks to tread. Dominions taken down. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out his name at the break of any day. Shout out his name at the break of any day. J E S U S, sweet Jesus. J E S U S, sweet Jesus. <laughs> Let loose, look up, consuming fire, come down, flood them, fill them, electrify their souls, purge them, send them, busting through the crowds, snatching souls up from the darkness we come. We're shouting out his name at the break of any day. We're shouting out his name at the break of any day. We're shouting out his name at the break of any day. J-E-S-U-S Sweet Jesus J-E-S-U-S Sweet Jesus We're going to get it down
it is, oh, this is so good because he's just giving it right now on the spot. When the blade comes from the master's hand, he is not trying to slice you. He's trying to sculpt you. Oh, Sculpture you. He's trying to sculpt you so you best represent the king. Oh, right. And so I, I, don't even, I don't even know how to remotely even explain our next brother. So someone who has been able to be nourished by his... Uh, who the Lord's created this person to be by gleaning from the vineyard the person is, is my dear friend Carla. And I'm going to have her introduce our next speaker. Give Carla McKenzie a hand. I met Clint a couple of years ago through Unplugged with Charles and Perry. And then I was asked to do a kingdom prayer group on another Zoom with another lady, Cindy. <laughs> and so we ended up being ministered to more than we actually did things, but now we're getting into things and learning more. But he's the most important person I've ever met in my whole life. And he has taught me the Father's love, which is hard to find in human beings when you've been abandoned and orphanated and all sorts of things, he brought me through to the realities that no, nobody has ever been able to do in, in the body of Christ. And so I have a lot of respect and adoration for this man. And I would like to introduce him and I'm still continuing on in another Zoom with him. <laughs> so, <laughs> Anyway, Clint Lalem. He's a wonderful yeah. human being. Yeah. We'll fix the pronunciation later. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I can spell better than I can pronounce. <laughs> There's a story behind that. Uh, the original spelling back in Norway was L A H L U M. Oh. And so you would say, pronounce it. Lala. Three cousins came to America, one dropped the H, one changed it to an L, the other one kept it. But of the three cousins, they still pronounce it the same. I'm going to give the mic to you. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. yes. Oh, oh, gosh. Hard acts to follow. <laughs> What's that? You're good. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you hear? Yeah. I'm quite blessed and honored, Sean and Steve, to open up your house. Some of you I've known for a while. Precious Charles and Perry. I think I met Sean shortly after that. Up in Redden. My name is Clint Lawton. Um, I'm the ninth of 11, born in North Central Montana. I am Jewish, Jewish roots on both my dad's side and mother's side, and uh, a lot of fire comes from that. Not knowing you're Jewish until later on when the father whispers in your ear, yes, you're Jewish. I grew up in uh, north central Montana on grandpa's farm, Grandpa Kantrovich, Polish word for son of a cantor. And those first five years, Father gave me the grace to stay without dishonoring my parents or family members. I ask in Yeshua's name. Those first five years out on the farm, I have maybe five memories. A brother a year older, he's got just loads of them after another. Mine are blocked out. Basically, Mother had 11 kids in 13 years. You women have had how many children? And mother was the eighth of 15. Mm. So, lots of babies. <laughs> because of the lots of babies, generally the mother wasn't the one who took care. It was the older sisters. Somewhere around the age of three to five. Back then it was common to be loaned out to a farm to help aunts and uncles and do things. Wow. One of the older sisters went out, who went to a farm where a man had a previous wife and died, three kids, 
remarried into dad's family. And lo and behold, these kids showed her how to do all kinds of stuff. And that came back into the family. And I want to be able to talk about this aspect of forgiveness. That's one of the words tonight, the power of forgiveness. What the sisters did should not have been done to a little boy. Waking up stuff that should not have. It's blocked out visually and hearing. But I know the spiritual baggage, having gone through many years of basically deliverance, getting cleaned up with stuff inside. So that set up a lot of walls around the heart. You know, fast forward a few years, drafted in the army, come out, get married, off to the work. Find myself in the desert in Southern California, Mojave Desert. Do you know what the word in Hebrew for desert is? Midbar. Midbar. What does it also mean? Where God speaks. A place where God speaks. If you find yourself in a desert, it's because God wants to get your attention. Mm-hmm. You were in a desert, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> it's a place where God speaks. Went through the death of my dad in the fall of 86, death of a marriage in January of 87, and mother, who is the only person who I can relate to as far as showing love, taking care of, compassion, what most of, I think, most of you mothers can relate to. After a five-year battle of cancer, I, as a man, I couldn't fathom her dying without saying, I love you to her at least one time. I was raising my sons as a single dad in California, very unusual. I have a deep set of lungs. I would put my sons to bed. I would go to bed. This is March, April, May of 1987. I would put a pillow over my mouth and just cut wrenching roar, travailing mm-hmm. until I would fall asleep. Mm-hmm. May 12, 1987, at 1.38 in the morning, I get this bout of travailing, travailing, just gut wrenching roar. And something inside finally broke. I know it was my spirit man. I simply (laughs) said, pillow over my mouth, and I'm speaking into the spirit realm. I cannot do it. You'll have to do it for me. I'm talking into the ether. Every single one of us knows there is a God, a creator. He wired us that way. He created us to know that. As soon as I said that, the spirit realm opened. This ball of fire shows up in here. I still today can see a thumb, a thumb over here, holding this ball of fire. And I sit up, looking through the pillow, looking through the blankets, and I'm looking at my legs protruding out of this ball of fire. And then watching the Holy Spirit seal envelope my spirit legs now I couldn't see my arms there's this thumb over here you can see it the light in the room I can't describe the love he put in my heart I can't describe still into this day four hours later though called up to Montana and a sister law just happened to be in the hospital mother had tubes she couldn't speak but she was still quite coherent and that wound up I love you, Mother. I appreciate all that you've done for me. There's no way I can repay the kindness that accepted Jesus. I spoke about 10 minutes to her. A sister-in-law just happened to be in the hospital. They held the phone up. After saying, basically, goodbye, I uh, get a phone call eight hours later. She went home. Now, I've, I've shared some of this with people around the world. For some reason... God wanted my attention, and he did it in a rather dramatic way of getting it. There are certain residual side effects from such an encounter. Um, I've heard the word veil many times tonight. Can you, with your spirit man, see through that veil into the spirit realm? Husband and wives... Can you see through that veil around your own heart and talk to your spouse, spirit to spirit? 
I'm going to challenge you. It's possible. It's possible to do that. So I spent the next three years, four years, going through kidnapping setups, hauled into court in Montana by Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and major, major battles to take my sons away from me. But God delivered me and my sons out of all of it. Miraculous. Miraculous. And uh, having a family like this, the support is an amazing, amazing part. To have a fellowship, which being a new believer at the time, you would think you would get some support. I didn't have a vehicle, someone provided the car. I didn't have the funds, someone provided the funds to go to the court case. Amazing time. But through that next four years, deliverance ministries, getting cleaned up of a whole lot of garbage inside, I needed to find out who I was. And it was shortly after that, I met a lady that I remember walking down the aisle on a Baptist church. I glanced over to the left, and I hear this whisper in the left over here. She's too good for you. I wanted nothing to do with women after the 10 years of what uh, they've gone through in the court cases and so forth. Brushed it off. Five years later, ended up marrying this beautiful strawberry blonde. Oh. And uh, spent nine years before she was fully disabled, dementia mm -hmm. facility for the next 10 years. Wow. To be able to take care of her. Mm -hmm. I physically couldn't do it at one point. But the Lord stepped in and took care of it. Now back to this issue of the Father's love. In uh, 2003, one of the sisters who had done this stuff back to, uh, not, not the farm, came out with her husband, University of Washington, did a procedure. I picked her up. They drive a couple hours north to Marysville. She just started pouring out all kinds of stuff that happened on the farm uncle's place and so forth. The majority of it I already knew but because of what the father had shown me. When I could then respond, I forgive you. I have been forgiven up much. Let me pray for you and your sons. One son is married, beautiful daughter. The other two sons are still single in their 50s trying to find life. The Promise, the generational aspect of promises, very powerful. Likewise, the disobedience and the, and the rebellion, it goes. It goes down through the family. When I had said that I, I forgive you, within weeks, I was off to Mexico City. A pastor friend, Roberto, come and see, come and see. The street kids in Mexico City. 2003, 4, and 5. Three trips, get on a plane, spend four or five days in Mexico City, walk around ministering to street kids. Gangs that were roughly 14 to 19, typically on the drugs, the vapors, acetone, <coughs> begging for food, money. In your speech, I'm sure most of you can relate to having a tongue. Most Pentecostal churches, what not, you can express aspect of tongues. I know the language, I have any language. I had an experience in Mexico City, the second trip, after ministering to these people. The leader of this gang, a 19 year old, was stoned, glanced over, demon possessed, you could see it in his face, and drunk. And after Roberto gives his message in Spanish, David, his son, was my translator. He gives a message in Spanish. And so he, okay, it's your turn. I don't know Spanish, but I hear what the Father's putting on my heart to speak. And my ear is hearing English come out of my tongue. The leader of the gang, I was giving a, a talk on nothing but the blood of Jesus can break that stronghold. He wants to kill, destroy, and steal. And uh, he made a motion with his hand to open up. 
As soon as he did that, the demonic presence was gone. And I found out from David, the translator, he was understanding in Spanish before David could translate to Spanish. <coughs> that is how intimately our Father is involved in our, our lives. Who we are. How, how we even talk. Okay? From Mexico City, it went on to trips to Israel, these precious friends. South Africa, India, Nepal, Indonesia. And I think we get back to my scribble notes. <laughs> I appreciate Steve talking a bit ago about the men. One of the primary areas in ministry that the Father has me involved in. I will get down on my knees on front of whether it's one woman or 300. Ask forgiveness on behalf of the men that had shot, raped, beat, killed, violated you. Some of you here have been deeply hurt by men. Whether it's a sibling, parent, grandparent, somebody. That's not what God intended. But the power of forgiveness is, is amazing. In Luke 9, verses 1 and 2, I think you're aware of, you're all disciples of Jesus Christ. Right? right? All professing? What does it say? You have been given all power, dunamis, authority, excuse me, to do what? Cast out devils, to heal the sick, to do miracles. In the body of Christ. Where do you see that going on today? That you would even have a pulpit safe for someone to bring up such a subject. The church in America is still on milk, not the meat of the word. But because of my childhood, I don't relate to the word authority. Yes, being in the army, not recognizing rank, I get in a boot camp. I don't salute this lieutenant walking by. You know who I am? <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you know who I am? Give me 20. You now do 20 push ups. Okay. Do 20 push ups. That's the authority used in a, in a wrong way. But because of my dad and the issues in the childhood, I don't really use that word authority. There's another interesting definition for it in the Greek, jurisdiction. I can relate to that very well. Jurisdiction. So what have I done, or my forefathers have done, contrary to scripture, to God's word? Not what I'm saying, not what you're saying. God's word is the standard. That is the Bible. It has to line up with the Word. It has to line up with the Word. If we do something contrary, violate one of these statutes, commandments, the laws, the covenants, what does the enemy do with that? We know he's the accuser. In the spirit realm, he is Gaining a little jurisdictional ground. How many of you have been to India? You're aware of the fact in India, if uh, you don't put a fence around your property and someone comes and kind of squats in a corner for very long, they acquire ownership of it. And you can't kick them out. They, they become owners of that. Similar in the spirit realm, when we do things contrary to what Scripture says, the enemy can, he knows it better, the Scripture better than we do. Mm -hmm. He knows every single dot, dot and diddle, yeah. everything. And we violate it, that's a jurisdictional accusation claim. The only way that that can be broken is through the blood of Jesus, Yeshua, okay? 
Do they acknowledge whatever the sin was, the iniquity, the transgression? Carte blanche. His sin, he was sinless. Perfect. The only perfect man that walked on the earth. No sin found in him. None of the rest of us can claim that. He was the only one who could buy all of mankind back from the fall in Genesis 3. Now, to break the jurisdictional claim, you have to be aware of that you did something contrary to what Scripture says. That's to acknowledge it, confess it, repent of it, and to clean house. Clean house, and where I move, is put to death of the works of the enemy, of the flesh, or you kick out the enemy. But you can't do that until the jurisdictional claim in the courts of heaven had been reconciled with the blood of Jesus. And that's kind of what I've been doing around since 2003 in my travels, helping people do that cleansing. I fully acknowledge I'm not capable of keeping my soul clean. I clean the house. I put the works in the death of the flesh. I invite the Holy Spirit into that room to occupy it for eternity. You cannot do it by yourself. It's a daily dependence upon it. Daily dependence. And I want to go back to this armed incident. And I'm bringing it up now because of just this last two weeks, making rounds in Montana to Idaho, seeing my siblings. A sister in Idaho brought up a memory that she had of a picture of me, an older brother, and a younger brother. We were referred to as the three little boys, never by name. We are the three biggest ones in the family now. But she brought up this picture. Do you remember the picture of three little boys being dressed up in dresses and put on the porch and pictures taken? And the expression that came over her face was kind of a mocking, laughing. And I very strongly <laughs> comment, when you find that picture, burn it. Because those three older sisters have no idea, none whatsoever, the tormenting hell that that door was opened up as their little boys back when they were two, three, four years old. I happen to turn around and I forgive you again. And just firmly ask her to burn it. Now I do know that we have certain areas of authority we can walk in. And it's a it's incumbent on me I think to go back to the oldest sister in Utah. You remember this picture? Please burn every copy you have and de delete every copy you have. If if you want my blessing if you don't want my blessing, then I will probably petition the Father for correction in your life. And I don't think you want that. So pray for me wisdom. That is one issue that needs to be taken care of. Oh boy, visions. I've heard Baal mentioned a few times tonight. In Genesis, when Moses went up on the, the mountain and he came down glory shining through, what did the people tell him to do? Cover his face. Cover his face. <clears throat> that word veil in the Hebrew. Um, it didn't block Moses' relationship with the Father. He still talked, communed, related with the Father. It blocked the people outside. Okay. Shortly after that incident, the episode of the molten calf, he came down and found a man surrounded partying with a molten golden calf. What did Moses do to that calf, golden calf? Melted it down. Crushed it into dust, put it in water, and made the people drink it. With the exception of one tribe. The Levites crossed the line over the side of Moses. Well, that word molten in Hebrew 
is the same word, veil. Do you think the people were putting a veil over their own hearts? Most certainly did. I've heard the rebellion spoken of tonight already. That same word shows up in Isaiah 30, verse 1. Children of rebellion that would add sin to sin. Children of rebellion have a covering that's not my covering. The my covering referring to the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit covering your spirit, you're an open target. Open target. So that you would add sin to sin. And you see that today in typically 99.9% .9 of the Jewish world. That veil is still over their hearts. You cannot talk to a Jewish person, an Israeli, and say you're, you have to be born again. It doesn't equate. You need to have a new spirit. They cannot separate their soul and spirit. They have a different meaning and understanding of soul, nefesh, spirit, ruach, than you learn from the New Testament and the Greek. They still, though, don't see it. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27, I will give you a new spirit. I will take the heart of stone out, give you a heart of flesh, and I'll put my spirit in you. I think we all can relate to that as basically the gospel, born again. It's in the Old Testament. The veil that's on their heart, they just blow right by it. How do you get rid of the veil over your heart? One of the aspects earlier with uh, Sean talking about walking in fire without getting burnt. When was the last time you went walking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire without being burnt? You can only do it in the spirit. This flesh wasn't made to do that. I think most of you have a clear meditating and waiting on the Lord to separate out and hear his voice when he's speaking. I know the Father loves me. I can't put into words. And I know Yeshua loves me. Most Christians refer to that love of, love of Jesus. Can you go on beyond Jesus to the love of the Father? That is the fire, calling, purpose. I've had 17 trips to South Africa. I've been on my knees in front of 300 women asking forgiveness. And South Africa is a very violent place. Women are not treated well. Women are not treated well here in America. That has to change. That has to change. The refining fire that God is going to bring to the church. The bride will be spotless. I am part of the bride. My husband is Yeshua. Most men have a difficult time saying that or relating to it. They have a husband. There is no gender in the spirit realm. That's only in our flesh. And a little bit in the soul realm. Certain differences emotionally. But kind of derived from the flesh. So when we walk in unity, that's that place in the spirit where we walk. One of the exercises, I think, back... That Delwin, back in Britain, Proverbs 4, 20 to 23, is a pattern that the Lord pointed out to me many, many years ago. If you want to be able to clearly hear his voice from all the other competing voices that come against you, my son, attend to my sayings, pay attention to the words 
Keep it before your eyes. That talks about the eye gate. Eye gate is the main door, men to the soul. Women, you have two ears. What you hear. How many of you have red letter edition Bibles? Take a red letter edition Bible. No cell phones, no disruptions, no other back beat music, nothing. Read out loud only the red letters of Jesus. So you have it coming in your eye gate, through your brain, out of your mouth, and into your ear. God's word goes through that veil, that filter, to our spirits. That's one of the easiest ways I've learned a long time ago to start recognizing all the competing voices out there. How do you test a spirit? Well, you've got to have a, some kind of a dialogue with it. No, you typically don't want a dialogue with demons. Trust me, you don't. You need to be able to recognize the image, the character, the personality, the reflection of Jesus so well. That is the voice. Anytime someone says something, me, every other speaker here today, is it coming from Father? Is it going through that filter to your spirit with the truth that touches and sets the captive free? Some of you know your Greek a little bit. In the New Testament, the word truth, what is the basic definition of truth? People look in the concordance, truth, truly, true. Okay. It's rooted in one word, though, that simply means to not conceal. What is concealed from your spirit right now? What veil is concealing something in the spirit realm? To me, that's what truth is. I've had too many episodes of the veil literally rippling in front of my eyes, these physical eyes, and seeing what's on the other side. What I call the red letter edition exercise, read the red letter, you start with the book of John because it's a love letter from God the Father to us, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, so that you can tune your spirit to recognize his personality, his image, his character. That points to, in scripture, I kind of categorized five categories of who talks to who. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Their voice is one. Their personality, Jesus was a little bit different, but they're one, we caught it. They're in agreement. There's many scriptures of angels talking to us. Do you talk to yourself? We each talk to ourselves. I'm talking to you, to other people. The fifth one is the fallen angel. Starting with Genesis 3.1. In the Hebrew, it's Nakash. Most translations use the word serpent or snake. Or deceiver. And uh, sadly, most people until later on in life, start to separate out his voice from other stuff. With trials and tribulations and refining fires. There was a word popped in on the way down here this morning that I think I'd uh, release it. How many of you know what a necromancer is? Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk to the dead. What is a necromancer? Talking to a dead being, yeah. dead entity. In Genesis 2.17, English translations have that word die in there only one time. Don't eat to that tree in the center of the garden of good and evil unless you die, die, if you read it in Hebrew. I recognize two deaths kind of coming on mankind. There was a spiritual death. The back was turned around, spiritually dead. And the deterioration of the physical flesh started happening. That word, Ruth, in Hebrew, 
it shows up in uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 11, necromancer. So God is saying, part of you eating that tree, you're going to tend to want to be necromancing. Meaning, you're going to want to talk to something in the ether. You want to talk to something out there. And tell me, the enemy is more than obliged to whisper in. Who is the first necromancer in Scripture? Snake. Pardon? Adam and Eve were the snake. Eve was. Eve, yeah. Because Eve is talking to Satan. the snake, Nakash. I like the concordance, the strong concordance, where they use the word hissing. What is a hissing sound in the spirit realm? It's a low decibel whisper kind of discussion. Very few people can pick up on the difference between his whisper, the still quiet voice of the Lord, or in some cases their own, their own thoughts. We have to learn to start separating that out. <clears throat> You separate that out. And to do that, you need to know the voice of Jesus so well. When that whispering voice in the spirit realm comes by, no, get behind me, Satan. You don't have to follow in to do what he's prompting you to do. Amen. And I think that's one of the areas that the men in this country and the world have fallen far, far short representing God the Father. I didn't, I had no memory of my dad those first five years out on the Kenthrovich farm. The next 10 years in time was living hell to the point of don't bother, you turn and run, hide. So I didn't have any father image. I had my desert encounter. I cannot describe the love that I know Papa has for me. And I have seen it time and time again, travels around the world and here in the country. Miraculous saving vehicles should have been dead, killed, no. Snatched from the fire. So, I'm reminded of one other word that you spoke about the promises. Who were the promises started with? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then the 12 tribes. Where are the 12 tribes today? I suspect I'm looking at some of them in here. The northern kingdom that had 10 and a half Scattered to all nations. Nobody knows who they are, except God and God alone. The present day term Jew or Jewishness can either be the tribe of Judah, or the tribe of Benjamin, or the Levi. It's all of those algamated into the national identity of King of, King of Judah. Jews. That's where the name comes from. The other ten tribes would be referred to as Israelites or Hebrews. Hebrew being Heber, the one who crossed over. Moses didn't cross over, but the other twelve tribes did. Have we given enough of a fire hose? <laughs> I can attest to the power of the blood of Jesus time and time again. There is power in the name. Amen. Okay? When you're reading your Bible, you read the power of the name of Jesus? What do you think a Jewish person encounters when they read their Bible? You know, his Hebrew name is Yeshua. Joshua is a form of Yeshua. 
most of the Old Testament words for salvation, saved, Joshua, in their own Hebrew tongue, when they read these passages, they are literally saying Yeshua. But the veil, they're not making the connection. Many verses that talk about God of my salvation. Well, my God, Yeshua. That veil is going to come off in some amazing times, I think, coming here very, very soon. Hallelujah. I think I've plowed enough tonight, Sean. So what, what, um, I, I can testify with what he's saying because I remember a year that the Lord had me write out the entire New Testament, just the red letter, nothing else, nothing else. And it was several times, just the red letter, nothing else. And um, there is something about even, so Clint said, you read it out loud, you're seeing it, you're hearing it, and you're speaking it, right? Well, then you could add, you're writing it, that's another sensory, or you're typing it, that's another sensory. And so I just think that, Modern science is proving that. Yeah. Dr. Carolyn Leaf in Texas has scientifically proven reading out loud the word to your brain will restructure the proteins and neural network synapses in your brain. Yeah. God's word has the power to do that. Yes. Oh, yeah. So can you, can you um, um, uh, expound on image? Image. The old man and the the, the, the rebirth of the man and then the moving forward. Can you expand on that a little? I don't have any memory or picture of what my old spirit looked like. Because of the dramatic fire incident in the desert, I see the ball of fire. I see my spirit legs. It's a, a blue color. And the Holy Spirit sealing up my legs is another kind of blue. The old man though that's the old nature okay uh, there are only two natures in mankind only two if you go through your scripture we are created in the likeness of Yeshua that's our original design likeness who we're supposed to reflect and be like by end of Genesis 3 There is a, uh, in the spirit realm, I see it like a light. How, how dark is that? A light is the darkness in you. If you stay underneath walking in the spirit with Jesus, his light, being an example, you take that light into a dark places, into a dead and dying world. If you resort to an act of the flesh, you're kind of by choice, choice of our own free will, you're moving yourself in the spirit back underneath the enemies. Light, shadow, darkness. We as people, humans, we're the only one given that free choice to go back and forth. You can choose. First John 3, 9 says, if you are born again, the incorruptible seed your spirit man cannot sin. Done deal. Paid for. Any sin, 1 John 3, verse 8, sin comes from the devil. Well, that's his influence on our individual lives, families, corporate, this country, the world. He is still a prince ruling around the world. And we see that darkness sadly overcoming our country in Washington, D.C. Remain under the shadow of his wing, it solves. Staying underneath his umbrella of protection. If you step out, you're underneath someone else's umbrella. There's no middle ground in it. He knows exactly when you're making that step one way or the other to 
It was something, do something contrary to scripture. The vileness of human flesh, we all know, is ugly. What man does to man. The Holocaust. It's been going on since before the flood. And God, our Father, has a plan. He is going to see it come to fruition. His time scale, not ours. And I trust him. There are many references in the Old Testament. All of Israel, all of Israel is going to be saved. All of Israel is going to know Yeshua. And you talk to an Israeli, Orthodox Jew, they'll nail their faith on that verse. It may have been in the time of Paul, the apostles, first century, many of the Jews that became believers in Yeshua back then. It may be today, someplace in the future. They hold the Father to his promise. All of Israel is going to be to know Yeshua, be saved, salvation. They don't they clearly admit they don't know when. That's going to happen. Did any of you know when you had the salvation planned in front of you? Did you prepare for it? No. The 34, I was 34 at the time in Southern California. Never saw a church except for a Catholic church. Funeral, a wedding, a Methodist summer school a couple times, Lutherans, Wallens, Norway, Lutheran, but never there. Never had a plan of salvation of the gospel expressed to me. And so my desert experience is somewhat abnormal. Most Christians go through a prayer of salvation. Most Jewish have to have a sign. I attest to the sign. Yeah. I realize some of these things I've spoken tonight have been kind of heavy. But I know the power of his word, what he put on my heart to speak and say. And particularly the power of forgiveness. You know, how many women I've seen them jumping up in joy and dancing. Mexico City, second, third trip. Was supposed to go down and minister to 15 women who got hold in the bag from their husbands. Abuse, drugs, and whatnot. They're the ones that go to prison to come back out and have to start life over. Going down for a three-day weekend retreat on a park. The day before I fly out, a hundred-year flood, the entire park's washed away. It ended up going to a friend's house. What was 15 women turned into 55 from the age of 8 on up to 75. And you end up speaking, okay, Father, what do I say? Talk about plowing, sowing, reaping the agricultural kind of terms. From 9.30, 11.30, started at 11.30, nonstop praying for people. One-on-one -on -one taking too long. Bring in seven groups, the men separate from the women. One lady saying she's dragging her foot around her leg like a club, the size of the thigh all the way down to her ankle. She kept pressing in, pray for my daughter, pray for my daughter, no, pray for you, getting her to forgive her husband for being unfaithful, raping her, beating her. The next morning in a Baptist church, she's up and dancing around in front of the congregation. Mm -hmm. And the Baptist pastor, wow, what happened to you? He explained, you can come down here and minister anytime. No, he wouldn't let me minister. I had to go out on the sidewalk. I finally get to meet this lady's uh, daughter. The spirit starts pulling up questions. How do you know so much about me? I don't. I know the one who does. 
that is my prayer for you. You learn to know that voice so well. That's how you minister. Right, brother? Lamentations 2.14 talks of the false prophets that tickle the ear so that the captives are not set free. The iniquity is what's holding them captive. False prophets do not expose the iniquity. Therefore, they're not set free. God is raising up prophets in this country and around the world to expose what that specific iniquity is that has that jurisdictional claim so that his people, us, we can be set free. It's not rocket science. It's simply the word. I have a tendency to interpret it literally. <laughs> yes, that bothers some people. <laughs> Any other questions? Thank you, Clint, for sharing your heart. You know, because as of a few hours ago, we were singing songs about breakthrough and Breakthroughs aren't pretty like waterproof mascara. You know, sometimes it just, it has to happen. The wounds have to be lanced so all the nasty stuff can come out or else we just waddle out the same way we waddled in. Mm -hmm. So appreciate your, your boldness because we need it. We need you, it. You're bringing to mind an incident in South Africa two years ago. Three years ago, I went down on a trip. Marketplace ministry, the, that event didn't happen. I do men's retreats down there as well. But this time I get put on an electric train across the country to Praetoria to listen to Angus Buchan preach, praying for the government. 1.8 million people on a big field listening to him preach was quite a blessing. I had on a pair of shorts, hiking boots, bright orange, because it was a hot day, bush hat. I spent an hour doing a prayer walk around the entire venue. The main stage, I couldn't get within 200 yards of it. It was just a sea of people. By the time I get back to where my group is, I see this San Koi, an indigenous San Koi person. Someone gave him a prayer shawl and a very nice shofar. He had the prayer shawl wrapped up here around like the Palestinian caps. That just, I couldn't take it. And he was trying to blow the shofar. So I interrupted him. Had him take this fresh off his table, off his head, and I showed him, you know, this is how you put it on, this is what it says in the Hebrew, and put it around his shoulders. Then I showed him how to blow the shofar. As I'm doing this, an Indian, um, a lady from Indian descent, there's a few hundred thousand of those in South Africa, she approaches me, and I'm looking a Afrikaner, the term Afrikaner, South African farmer of Dutch origin, okay? The Boer Wars, English fought the Dutch, so forth. And I'm covered in soot because of the walk I just did. And she approaches me and asks me in Afrikaans. And I responded in English, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, then she, in English, do you know about Hebraic roots? We well, yes. And she was bold enough to press in, would you consider coming back with me and my group to Langabon? I don't know, I'll pray about it, I'll let you know later. I knew she was in our group, so she had to come from the same train I was on. Later on the train, cleaned up, found her. Papa says yes. And talk about rumor mill. Here this big popper car approached this lady, she was about 65. She's been a pastor for 50 years. Are you going to bring a stranger back to Langabon? I met some interesting people. Uh, Catherine and Philip from India, a bunch of other interesting people. The following year, going back down to South Africa, into a small fellowship, not interdenominational. And it was during that particular trip, fathers asked me, ask forgiveness. And with her permission, I got down on my knees in front, and her name was... I guess I'll say just am, hey, not the normal name. Would you forgive the men who have beat, raped, 
and I'm killing you. And it was like this wash just came off of her spirit. She had been raped by an uncle who told her that she would never mount anything for numerous years at the age of nine. She was forced into a, an alcoholic relationship with an Indian man. Two kids, divorced. Then she was forced into a marriage with an Afrikaner, which is basically white, Dutch, big farmer kind. And this man proceeded to abuse her too, tried to kill her, hold her up on the wall, throat, choke her, surgeries and so forth. And to see me, a big white man, on my knees in front of her, asking forgiveness, she just broke, broke and, and washed. And as an act of the spirit, you cannot do the forgiveness from your flesh, difficult from your soul realm. It's purely an act of the spirit to say, I forgive. That's where the breaking of the jurisdictional claim the enemy has happens. The next week, people were looking at her. She'd been pastored in this area for 35 years. Never told anybody. Nothing. And they would look at her. What happened to you? That glow that Moses had? It was noticeable. Very noticeable. The power of forgiveness is amazing. You see the Father show up. They bring healing, physical healings. I typically would share you some preaching and there would be anywhere from four to five people come by for prayer time throughout the week. My time in South Africa is all ministry. Marketplace, ministry to couples, singles. We have such a loving father. I can't do anything else. I can't do anything else. The passion that he put in my heart to help people to help them get healed, to forgive, to get over it. I have a tendency to look at most issues in people's lives to be more spiritual than in physical. <clears throat> Sitting down and chatting with somebody, I generally rather quickly find an unresolved spiritual issue that's been left to fester and fester for way too long. He loves us enough, he's given us a way to get healed. He won't force it on us. After my desert experience, the travailing, King David is one of my favorite people because of the travailing of the spirit, the wailing that he <coughs> the scripture talks about. Charles, when was the last time you did gut wrenching, travailing, wailing, weeping? Steve, as men, it should be something that's just right there. The compassion, the readiness to travail with somebody, whether it's yourself or someone else. Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this opportunity and this time. And I thank you, Father, that what's been spoken would plow deep, deep, deep into hearts to bring about your purpose. Your purpose for each one of us. That there would be fruit from it, Father. To set the captives free. There is freedom and power in your name. <coughs> So, Father, pour your healing oil, Gilead's oil, abundantly upon everyone here. Their families, their children, their grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Pour forth abundant oil of joy and healing abundantly in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. For the live stream, we're going to take a 10-ish minute break back at 9, um, so 
in about 15 minutes, 9 p.m. Pacific. Sure. Yeah. <laughs>